I walk among these people and keep my eyes open. They have become smaller and are becoming even smaller. And this is because of their teaching on happiness and virtue. Round, righteous, and kind they are to one another. Like grains of sand are round, righteous, and kind to one another. At bottom, these simple ones want one simple thing, namely that no one harm them. To them, virtue is whatever makes tame and modest. This is how they made a wolf into a dog and mankind himself into mankind's favorite pet. Nietzsche has always been a babawanga of philosophy, outlined what would later become a self-domestication hypothesis, the idea that humans were selected for their ability of friendliness and cooperativeness. According to this hypothesis, beta males have gathered against a single alpha male and dethroned him through a consistent tyrannicide where psychopathic tendencies were selected out from the gene pool, Beta males have set up social norms and rules, which then would prevent people from um, psychopathic and uh, narcissistic tendencies to um, seize the power. Hence, human dominance hierarchy, unlike the dominance hierarchies of other primates, is reversed, whereas we are ruled by the coalition of beta males as opposed to a single alpha male, who would have a complete monopoly over all human resources. This then corresponds to Nietzsche's critique of Darwinism in his book Twilight of the Idols, where he claims that in humans the survival of the fittest or the survival of the strongest is not at play. Rather, we are dealing with the survival of the most spiritual, cunning, and deceptive, the most social animal. All right? That's why Homo sapiens, the sweaty, collectivist, group-thinking animals, have substituted Neanderthals, who are autistic, proud, and disagreeable. Since in the modern times of bestialization, a pursuit of academic career, reading books, and going to university is considered to be a form of waste of time and is ridiculed, I thought it would be a good idea to revisit Peter Slordyke's essay, The Rules for the Human Zoo. Now, with this essay, Peter Slordyke, being a German proud philosopher with his Neanderthal heritage, has stirred up some heavy controversy. And in academic circles, he was criticized and called all sorts of things, such as being a Nazi, which is, I guess, one of the best tools that people have to criticize ideas that they do not agree with. However, Peter Sloterdijk, being who he is, isn't afraid to come up with dangerous ideas, as he thinks that philosophy is something that should never be tamed and domesticated. Now, in this essay, Sloterdijk maintains that the self-taming project, which spanned from Christianity up to the World War II, has unfortunately failed. So we now will have to come up with other forms of self-taming and self-domestication, which might include a future anthropotechnological means of biological engineering, genetic manipulation, etc. Now the electronic technology, with its bestializing properties, naturally favors people who exhibit a machismo temperamental energy. So it basically put an end to a long-sought project of a literate society. Now, Peter Sloterdijk speaks about two forces that operate within the social matrix, within the cultural matrix. A force of disinhibition. Disinhibition and disinhibiting media basically denotes a form of breaking the break, whereby your prefrontal cortex is inhibited, which in and of itself is a structure that, that is there to inhibit your primal impulses. So disinhibition then is a bestializing force, whereby you sublimate your inner beast in someone who will who will do it for you. Meaning, let's say in ancient Rome, the bestializing, disinhibiting media had to do with public hangings and gladiatorial fights, where a commoner would go to a stadium and engage in a collective frenzy, hence releasing his primal tendencies. Now, on the other hand, according to Slaughterdyke, the counterbalancing force to the uh, bestializing uh, media is uh, the force of taming whereby you calm your inner beast. And according to Slaughterdyke, this happens through reading books. The modern equivalent of bestializing tendencies has to do with social media, TikTok, UFC fights, YouTube dramas, etc., which allows you to unleash and express the desires of your inner beast, of your inner Andrew Tate. And that's why, uh, basically, electronic technology will eventually favor people who can express most of their um, uh, explosive and uh, machismo energy, because electronic technology is in and of itself a disinhibiting media. Unfortunately, 
books have lost their counterbalancing force in modern Western society, thanks to electronic technology. So basically what is going to happen is that Western civilization will usher into a complete disintegration because the cornerstone that uh, bound uh, a Western society together is annihilated because the Western canon, which basically describes the corpus of high culture literature, is deconstructed and basically discarded. But we will get to that uh, when I will discuss the um, idea of humanism and what is the function of humanism. There is a one interesting anecdote about Voltaire and how he participated in some form of bisexual orgy. When asked to do the same thing again, he replied, well, once a philosopher, twice a pervert. Sloterdijk too mentions that a humanist might occasionally stray into a warmongering, roaring crowd, but only for the purpose of reminding himself that he is also a human being. And when returning to, to his home, ashamed of his participation, he will actively choose a medium of taming as opposed to the medium of bestialization. And in this action of actively and consciously subjugating yourself to a taming media, as opposed to the media of bestialization, you enter into a project of humanism. Now, humanism, according to Slorodyke, is a form of anthropodicy, whereby humans can be saved from their bestial tendencies by calming their inner beast through reading books. Basically, humanism puts trust in humans through the media of reading and writing, whereby humans can basically emancipate themselves from the bestializing nature by taming themselves into reading books and becoming lawful, suggestible citizens. Hence, humanism is a social experiment where people are trying to underwrite friendship through sending thick letters to friends. This is how Peter Slordag defines it. Now, you have probably heard the concept of post-humanism, whereby uh, humanism and the ideal properties that were ascribed to human nature no longer stands when we enter into this form of nihilistic, hedonistic society. But in order for us to understand what post-humanism is, we need to take a glance at this golden age that preceded the post-humanistic age. So, in other words, what is that humanism that Western society has surpassed? Now, Peter Sloterdijk uh, defines a man of culture uh, a bit differently, uh, not like um, in modern ones who enjoy uh, futanaris and uh, bubble butts and, you know, have this burning desire to be sucked in in the uh, belly of the great mother archetype. You know, the, the men of culture in the past were people who identified, uh, you know, although uh, unconsciously, as bibliophiles, people who subjected themselves to the taming media of books and reading. Hence, humanism, according to Peter Slordyk, is a form of telecommunication between people through written material, where they are trying to move other people to the uh, act of loving philosophy and act of loving reading. To quote, What are modern nations except the effective fictions of literate publics, who have become a like-minded collective of friends through reading the same books? Humanism, then, according to Peter Slorodijk, spanned from Christianity up to Enlightenment and World War II. This was a project whereby Western civilization thought that it could, let's say, um, combine Athens or the ethos of Athens with the ethos of Jerusalem and hence create a new subject, a new human being who would harbor both goods, the good of revelation and spirituality, and good of reason and rationality. This was basically the idea of combining Jesus with Socrates. However, as we are going to see, according to Peter Slordyk, this form of self-taming and manufacturing of a lawful citizen has failed. And now we will have to be ushered in a form of specious politics, which will substitute the old politics of taming through inhibiting media. Now, in the past, unlike today, reading was regarded as a form of magical power. People who knew how to read or how to work with books were thought to have other forms of magical capabilities. And Sloterdijk points out that the word magic also comes from the word grammar. And this elite club of book lovers who would come up with world-improving projects, um, you know, were some form of glamorous society. This elite, posh, people who enjoyed the same books. And the word glamour then is also related to the word grammar. To quote, 
At heart of humanism so understood, we discover a cult or club fantasy, the dream of portentous solidarity of those who have been chosen to be allowed to read. Now, what you need to understand is that the ability of reading, or the way um, Peter Schlorodijk is using this term, has nothing to do with modern ability of reading. The fact that you can recognize letters has nothing to do with it. Um, by reading, what Schlorodijk means is a form of hyper-executive function, whereby these elite book lovers will read the same books and come up with a form of political projects whereby their theoretical knowledge will be implemented into a practical political decisions. But now the question is, what is a function or purpose of these elite book lovers? Uh, what do they want from us? Or what is their overarching goal? Why do they form such book clubs? Well, according to Pierre Slordag, it is a foundational bedrock of a nation-state. And hence, the reason why nowadays nationalism and patriotism and the national boundaries are being broken down is because we live in a post-literate society. According to Peter Slordag and also by Mar uh, according to uh, Marshall McLuhan, um, nationalism and a form of strong immune system that separates one culture from another is an extension of a literate society. Now, the way it is achieved is by compiling canons which come from the intellectual elite. One such canon, the most popular one, which I already mentioned, is Western canon. And it is not a coincidence that Western canon was a target of criticism and deconstruction by postmodernists. Because what basically Western canon is, it is, it is, it is a form of medium through which you inculturate yourself into a, um, let's say, into a ethos of your society. It is a form of initiation ritual. You basically make yourself acquainted with those high cultural literature, and then you are initiated into the cultural ethos of a uh, specific society, in the case, in, 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 a, in, a, in a form of immune system of a Western society. If you are interested in exploring what Western canon was and why we are entering into a form of cultural amnesia by losing our, our touch with the, with the ethos of Western civilization, you can check out Harold Bloom, who was basically a last surviving dinosaur of a visual Gutenbergian paradigm. Harold Bloom in his times expressed a frustration in how literacy rates were declining and how students were no longer as erudite and as willing to uh, read high culture literature as it once was in the past. And Peter Slordyke then will subliminally point out that once you lose a touch with your canon and with your high cultural literature, what happens is that the metaphysical dome that protected you from the identity crisis is, will basically break down. And now you become a form of a cultural nomad with no protecting shell, which basically has a function of immunizing you from a meaning crisis. Now, the education system, which has become a target of criticism, and rightfully so, was never intended to produce geniuses and Einsteins. You know, nowadays, people criticize public education uh, by, you know, pointing out that it doesn't really teach you anything of worth, and it is a waste of time, it basically robs you of your money, and so on and so forth. However, what Peter Slordyke basically tries to do in this essay is to show you that actually the purpose of public education has completely different plan. And the purpose of education actually has to do with a form of self-taming, a voluntary self-taming. Now here we approach one of the greatest insights of this essay, namely that public education is an inevitable outgrowth of humanistic society. Because after you have an elite club of book lovers, this cognitive elite, or who basically comprise a creative minority of a society, what they eventually try is to come up with some form of means to domesticate and tame other people. And public education is a form of self-taming. It is a social practice whereby you manufacture lawful citizens. And this happens through a consistent practice of reading and self-control. But what is public education in school, if you think about it? You need to fix your eyes on your text. Book. You need to listen to your teacher, take uh, his or her um, recommendations into account. You need to go to school at a set time. You need to 
practice discipline and do your homeworks. You need to self-inhibit yourself to a degree where no distractions will basically snatch your mind when you're trying to read the book or read your textbook. You will also need to engage in a very high level self-regulation when you're trying to, let's say, give some give present PowerPoint presentations in universities where you need to articulate yourself, organize your thoughts, and so on and so forth. This is a repetitive practice of self-domestication and self-taming, whereby you inhibit your sensory motor impulses and interiorize it into a form of inner world. And this repetitive self-inhibiting behavior, whereby you need to sit on your chair, don't move, listen to teacher, etc., etc., it basically creates a citizen which is endowed with two properties. He is suggestible and he is lawful. And that's what a humanistic society demands of you, which is, by the way, which is good. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, paint some form of conspiracy here. Hence, the purpose of humanism is to prevent barbarism. It is a form of vaccination against bestialization, against a force of barbarism, which is taking over our society through internet and emerging uh, temperamental social groups that are challenging the core values of Western society, such as literacy, reading books, and contemplating higher abstract matters. However, you might ask that in today's day and age, what happens is that basically a majority, or basically commoners, uh, are trying to rebel against a cognitive elite, uh, or the, the way it is defined in modern um, you know, social media, the matrix, or whatever. In order to understand this phenomenon, we need to um, take a detour to British historian Arnold Toynbee. According to Toynbee, the creative force of culture is always comprised by its creative minority. Creative minority basically creates the cultural and artistic forms, which then are imitated by majority. And through this form of mechanical repetition, culture subsequently exhausts its creativity, and hence creative minority basically transforms into a dominant minority. And the difference between the creative minority and dominant uh, minority is that the creative minority tries to progress the culture by coming up new cultural forms, whereas the dominant minority is in the state of stasis, where all it does is that it tries to preserve its power. And that's when the breakup between the commoners and the cognitive elite takes place. Now commoners are disenfranchised and they are alienated from the cognitive elite because they no longer feel at one with their cultural elite. So hence, according to Sloterdijk and in some sense Arnold Toynbee, it has always been the case that cultural elite uh, rules and forms the cornerstone of a given social formation. It's just the difference between the late phase of culture and the early phase is that in the earlier phases, um, commoners feel at one with um, a, a cultural minority, whereas in the late phase, when creative minority transforms into a dominant minority, the, the breakup uh, takes place and commoners uh, feel alienated. Now, to summarize the forces that basically ended the literary society, uh, according to Slordag, has to do with uh, two uh, major transformations. One uh, that basically um, happened because of World War II and Nazi Germany, and another has to do with uh, new media innovation, whereby radio, TV, and then internet basically substituted uh, written material as a, a form of privileged uh, media of communication. Nowadays, books can never compete with internet. Um, so if, you're, if you try to underwrite friendship with um, yet unidentified friends by using the medium of print, then you are engaging in some form of subculture because uh, book loving now became a form of marginalized uh, practice as opposed to being a, a form of cultural center. Whereas uh, World War II has to do with the fact that basically Nazi Germany showed that a humanistic society has its shadow side and all of a sudden literate society couldn't erase the memory of Hitler and genocide and get back to um, you know, Shakespeare and Goethe if uh, Hitler had never existed.
And Nazi Germany here is very important because Nazi Germany in some sense constitutes a form of ecstatic combination of disinhibition and bestialization, you know, in the form of them trying to, you know, um, um, kill off the health of the planet, and a, a form of humanism with their fetishism of high culture and aesthetics and, you know, so on and so forth. So which shows that um, humanism then has its shadow side, uh, which uh, cannot then constitute the core of society in the same way, let's say, other forms of metaphysical theories could. Now here we approach the second part of this essay, where basically Sloterdijk will use humanism, or the project of humanism, which has failed, because uh, the bestializing behavior rises exponentially with social media and UFC and so on and so forth. Um, basically, uh, then Sloterdijk will use humanism as a bridge to get to a more fundamental truth, namely the fact that humans are uh, differentiated from other animals by virtue of them be being self-domesticated. And that self-domestication shows up in the property of neoteny. Neoteny being this uh, idea that humans, unlike other animals, are born premature. And that premature bornness basically opens up the space for enculturation through language. Now, Peter Slordyke wants to understand how is it that we transformed from thinking animals to thinking men. What were the primary enterprises that basically transformed us into cultural beings? And according to Slordyke, it has to do with three elements that formed a some kind of biopolitical unity. And this has to do with language, house, and pets. To quote, only in few places is the wail of philosophical silence about men, the house, and the animals as a biopolitical unity lifted. Now, the reason why uh, pets, language, and houses are of high importance for Slordyke has to do with the fact that these three basically comprise the foundational symbols for our self-domestication. According to Slordyke, we, unlike other animals, are self-taming creatures. We voluntarily create some form of eco-parks where we organize ourselves and create some norms and laws with which our behavior is governed. To quote, humans are self-fencing, self-shepherding creatures. Wherever they live, they create parks around themselves. In city parks, national parks, provincial or state parks, eco-parks, so everywhere people must create for themselves rules according to which their compartment is to be governed. Now, the reason has to do with the fact that with the emergence of house, what came into being is theory building. Peter Slordyke points out that um, in ancient times, theory or theorizing was considered as a form of looking out from the window. Basically, window created a concept of theorizing uh, because basically you have a window because, because you have a house and in house you have leisure and through leisure and looking out from the window you basically come up with some form of vision, some form of theory. And that's why theorein, which is a Greek word, has to do with vision. Uh, you know, most of the time in Indo-European languages visualization is always connected with thinking. Now, what's important here is that through us coming up with some form of enterprises and some form of theories, we create selective forces for domestication. Uh, then we're going to sort out people in their ability to conform to those enterprises. And that's where friendliness and cooperativeness and self-domestication come from. However, it is important to note is that, you know, lots of people do not actually will themselves into those um, uh, domesticative uh, enterprises, but they are willed. And that's why he quotes Nietzsche's phrase about how uh, in those small houses where Zarathustra has found himself, you know, most of those people are willed as opposed to um, you know, actively choosing themselves to be self-tamed. However, these then going to be changed in humanistic society, where through reading books, uh, people are going to voluntarily enter themselves into this project of self-taming. Now, pets then have to do with the fact that uh, humans, uh, unlike other animals, have a consistent practice of domesticating other animals, which then is projected back onto humans. And that's where he gets to Plato and his dialogue Statesman, where basically Plato will talk about uh, what makes the best statesman, and uh, he will basically analogize statesman with a shepherd. 
basically a statesman is going to be a master of shepherding. Uh, now, before we get to Plato and statesmen, it's important to um, you know, take another detour to the executive hypothesis of self-domestication, which basically tells us about the first enterprise that humans came up with uh, that uh, made us uh, who we are, that basically formed a cornerstone to the emergence of the social brain, which, lacks in, uh, which is lacking in other animals, or you know, lacking in the way that we possess it. And this uh, first enterprise has to do with TCK, which stands for uh, Targeted Conspiratorial Killing. This is a consistent tyrannicide, which I talked about in the beginning of the video, against reactive aggression and against uh, alpha males by uh, beta males, by an alliance of beta males. Uh, that's why uh, the, the, the paper about the exec executive hypothesis claims that um, uh, you know, most of the societies, not, not most, but virtually all such societies are governed by um, a coalition of beta males as opposed to a single alpha male. Uh, you know the, the archaic structure of uh, you know a single alpha male ruling some form of social formation is only left in some form of adolescent gang groups or in kindergartens. Um, okay, and maybe uh, it is going to be a future of our society since electronic technology, with their new emergence of uh, machismo energy, will produce this bestializing um, tendencies of. Um, of you know some sort of a gorilla alpha male romanticism i guess and it's also worth noting that homo sapiens fossil uh, remains of homo sapiens show a consistent evidence uh, for self domestication which is exhibited in fact that uh, our facial width uh, has been decreasing since uh, basically we came out from the Africa. Uh, we, we've got smaller teeth than you would usually expect in primates. We're more cooperative, more friendly. Uh, our stature and, and um, the, the cranial capacity has also decreased. Uh, and uh, all those traits of self-domestication, are those traits are lacking in uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans, which in some sense shows what was this primary force that uh, differentiated and made Homo sapiens successful um, as opposed to Neanderthals and Denisovans. Now, one reason Peter Slordak thinks that this um, dialogue is of utmost importance is because he basically thinks that introduction of writing, and, and hence reading, uh, created a form of paradigmatic shift, a paradigmatic change between a preliterate society, meaning a society that lacked writing, and society which was based on some form of writing system. And the reason has to do with the fact that it created a yawning gap between those who could read and those who could not. And according to Slordyke, it amounts to a species differentiation. Okay, and uh, you know, no wonder ADHD and dyslexia and inability to read and you know, inability to concentrate and all those problems that children face in schools is so popular. Is because you know, according to Slordyke, actually this property of uh, you know th th this ability of reading, you know, has to do with the, the cognitive elite, uh, and and it's just an experiment whereby the cognitive elite is some somehow inviting you to this act of self-taming, which, um, thanks to electronic technology, um, you know, it turns out to be a failed project. And that's why Pierce Slaughterdijk's thinking uh, is dangerous here, because um, he naturally um, leads us to the question of nature of difference between commoners and the cognitive elite. Namely, is the difference between the creative elite and commoners just quantitative and accidental, meaning that um, they're just uh, smarter. They just have like um, a bit better brains. Or is it qualitative and paradigmatic? Are they fundamentally different people? Well, you know, this is very uh, important and relevant because uh, lots of people uh, tend to think that uh, we're governed by idiots. And this is false. As a matter of fact, the new statistical analysis show that people at the top, you know, executives, uh, you know, people in the government and in the Davos, etc., etc., they comprise the cognitive elite. They come from the most elite colleges, which require high SAT scores, 
that uh, exceed 1400, which is which basically um, places you in one percent of population in regarding your uh, intellectual abilities. So uh, Peter Slordak here is being pretty esoteric when he uh, points to this idea that um, uh, the cognitive elite or the creative minority with the higher ability of reading and implementing their ideas are basically separated from commoners to a degree where they uh, they stand closer to gods than they stand clo than they stand to humans. And now uh, this uh, separation. Uh, between commoners and the cognitive elite is very important to understand modern political dynamics uh, with respect to the emergence of red pill community and the machismo energy. Because what you see with this uh, matrix narrative and this Andrew Tate drama is that you have an internal proletariat with their high temperament, illiterate, dyslexic, right hemisphere, expressive, uh, you know, unregulated um, uh, behavior against the um, cultural core of the West, this l white, uh, left-brainer, phlegmatic uh, people who have trained themselves to, you know, engage with text studies, materials, and implement them into a real world. That's why you see in those red pill communities, which basically comprises the uh, internal proletariat of the Western society, that they frown upon books and philosophy and reading, because uh, th this is basically a result of this gap between the commoners and, and the cognitive elite, which has resulted with the introduction of electronic technology because electronic technology now allows such, uh, you know, let's say, um, machismo people to show themselves. You know, imagine Andrew Tate becoming successful in a world where uh, the only means of communication uh, was a written material which would basically filter out and inhibit this charisma and, and you know, expression at persona and etc etc. Of course electronic technology is what basically creates the space for bestializing powers. And now to summarize um, Peter Slordak's essay, which of course uh, doesn't involve the even more dangerous esoteric parts, which then I will discuss on my Patreon, and you know that's why um, I uh, rebranded my Patreon into the Club of Archivists because that's that's how um, Peter Slordak ends his essay. Uh, the idea that um, uh, you know in order for you to access the esoteric truth, uh, you need to basically sweep through the dusty archives and find the ancient texts that are uh, pretty relevant today, as opposed to trying to find some alt right. Uh, you know, uh, you know, underground authors who are just uh, ricochets and, and offshoots of uh, Plato, um, and um, you know, here when he discusses Plato's statesman, he uh, you know makes a very interesting remark. Quote. What could be more grotesque than the definition of politics as a discipline that concerns itself with the herd animals who travel by foot? Now, Plato's dialogue um, statesman launched the whole discourse of, of thinking about society as a form of political zoo, where shepherds, the elite, have the ability or the uh, privilege to choose the way they are going to domesticate humans into useful citizens. And what basically uh, the insight that um, Slordak provides is that good shepherd who basically mastered a royal practice of anthropotechnology is someone who understands the gap between him and the common people and who resorts to a form of voluntary self-taming as opposed to tyrannical form of self-taming. And this connects back to the um, to our discussion about beta males and self-domestication. Basically what happens is that we have selected against tyrannicide, so the form of self-taming which public education puts us through is voluntary, because that's what basically differentiates democracy from uh, tyranny. Because ty all tyrannies, because they are so stiff, they break down. Whereas democracy, which basically tells you to self-tame yourself voluntarily, you know, somehow has found this gold, this, this Goldilocks zone, whereby although cognitive elite still somehow uh, suggest to you that you need to uh, conform to their social norms, it is still done in a voluntary way. You believe that you are the one who is putting yourself through this form of uh, self-taming and uh, you know act of self-education, and that's basically what uh, differentiates a master shepherd uh, from a dilettante who tries to force people into this form of domestication. Lastly, uh, if 
all this time, um, the project of self-taming through the Antropa technology of reading and training yourself with written material has failed, then how can we avert our eyes to a possible species politics that awaits us? Since it took few decades for people to usher themselves into a form of bestialization from the high humanistic society, then cognitive elite has to come up with new forms of technology whereby we will allow ourselves to become uh, literate again. Uh, because, well, there's no way books are ever going to compete with the disinhibiting media of uh, TikTok and electronic technology of uh, this YouTube dramas and, and TV, Netflix TV shows, etc. Now, to summarize Peter Slordyke's one of the most important insights that, that comes through this essay, uh, we need to understand that this Nietzsche's idea uh, that basically um, Christianity had a pre-mediated uh, project to defang and tame humans into friendly uh, poodles uh, have failed. And, and if it did, then we need to think about future forms of anthropotechnology. To quote, it suffices for now to make clear that for the next period of time, species politics will be decisive. This is when it will be learned whether humanity, or at least its culturally decisive faction, will be able to achieve effective means of self-taming.